good morning thank you so yeah <laughs> yes uh, sorry so i am going to be speaking about this uh, slightly different thing called testing in production which for some odd reason seems to give a lot of people when they first hear about the concept of minor heart attack like thing yeah what that's a horrible idea what are you doing but we were with production you can't touch it production is supposed to be stable what do you mean testing no just insanity right testing in production or as we nowadays call it reality but this has been a well known truth for a long time everybody has a test environment and only some people are lucky enough to have production so it's a famous quote so we have a process that was designed back when software was being written for stand alone pcs and you would have you didn't even have a network or occasionally well you might have had windows for work groups we haven't really updated uh, most of our processes since the 1980s well because they kind of work for us right classical process you have a dtap environment development your laptop your desktop whatever developers can do what they like within reason well for very very wide ranges of reason oh i would like to upgrade stuff or not upgrade stuff it's up to you suddenly and then you have to go worry about every developer just coordinating between themselves and keeping is this the correct version of software or not then you get testing oh everybody's got a merge commit in well and now we have to in end of sprint let's integrate and then you spend two days doing integration well they think it's stable code it's tested and therefore should be correct as we know tested code does not necessarily guarantee correctness then you get acceptance where qa or some third party verify stuff and then you may have a performance testing environment and a few others and then you go into production which is supposed to be something that developers don't touch it's supposed to be touched by operations who don't know anything about code well in theory they know nothing about the real about code and then you you are like what why is this broken because you know did, oh, we didn't think make we made assumptions we made things we didn't think about these things because we didn't know what's missing in that list this you don't have feedback loops from users to developers directly what you end up with is oh we put something into production it took us two days to get things in or even half a day of rolling out code or 15 minutes whatever i have never seen one of those environments do really quick roll outs feedback loops requirements well what do the users want as henry ford put it oh if i had asked the users for what they want they would have said they wanted faster horses not cars so they would have no idea about reports the bug reports well they come filtered in through help desk much later and then somebody will try its things and filter a thing to from help desk level 1 to level 2 to level 3 and then so on until it gets to a product owner who goes hmm, this is a very low priority bug or this is a high priority critical bug fix it now people don't test for latency modern networks are pretty wide and mod well, is the internet if you are not writing desktop software your latency is going to be a thing in india apparently something like 80% of people are now on uh, mobile only users so if you are trying to talk to somebody who is in there well they have ipv6 ipv4 behind carrier grade nat and mobile phones so latency can be very very variable even here where you have a fast network try do browsing in a p uh, packed train sometime it's really slow on the wifi so you can't guarantee that things will work because well may what happens to a single page javascript app it just doesn't load total fail soft failure modes because systems aren't always down you can handle a hard failure but what if your database is slow what if software what if servers get overloaded they aren't respond they are responding just not fast user experience is horrible there are no metrics 
that people can see from production generally because well why do the developers need to know about production metrics and why does anybody else need to know about all these details if it's not their business well business is everybody's business and of course the famous last one operations security actual fact that systems need to run logging all these things are what uh, developers used to classify as non-functional requirements very bad term for it but hey so it wasn't really important it wasn't a priority and nowadays you this is actually pretty critical oh and then of course the famous knowledge questions do you not the last one is the critically important one there what do you not know that you don't know the only place where you can learn this from is well, production do you even have an idea of what to ask if you have the data well you can get data but do you have an idea of the right questions to ask in my experience most people don't i mean and not even everybody gets to ask the right questions all the time so reality well it sucks we all know that it's messy users don't know what they need and by the time you have written software users will have different needs it's a pain especially if if you're doing if you're not doing enterprise sales this is important the good thing is the pareto principle applies there so you can get if you can solve 20% of your problems with the actual software testing making sure that it works 80% of your issues of your easy to solve issues will go away i'm not saying that you don't write tests i'm saying that testing before writing a lot of tests and getting 80% or 90% software test coverage is not necessarily as important as being able to say oh i can detect errors later and respond quickly reality is this nice little complex system and if you have read the papers how complex systems fail well tells you that every complex system is always in a state of partial failure it sometimes works it sometimes doesn't it's on off sometimes it's just slow random components fail and uh, as uh, leslie lamport put it a distributed system is one where the failure of a random computer you don't even know existed make sure you can't work for, uh, the principles of product development flow is an excellent book for uh, if you are trying to do software development uh, i would recommend this rather than the goal with uh, anyway so test driven business is like test driven de design or test driven development it makes sense to a lot of people suddenly and you're doing a test which is like well what do my users actually say it's a survey but except you put the survey is running somewhere in the background and you can actually track user behavior then you go yep this is what people are doing this is what people are not doing and say like, okay well now we know what people are doing and we know what they're giving going to give us money for kind of important if you're running a modern day business then fast feedback loop enable it to speak the language of business you can go up to your managers with real data you can go to product owners with real data and say this idea that you thought of was fantastic doesn't work this idea that you people thought suck works or this was a good idea bad idea and you don't have to depend on your manager's opinion on the topic uh, there is a thing called uh, hippo which is the highest paid person's opinion and that one is has traditionally been the deciding factor on what features to include in products it's not necessarily a useful thing but it usually isn't but hey that was the thing metrics what are the development but developers how do they think it's good you know software is testable the code has tests it is you have don't repeat yourself for principles followed it's object oriented functional choose your religion of the day then you go to an ops person and they have completely different of metrics well it's bug free it scales it has performance it has security it can be monitored so we know that it is running or something and then you go talk to the people who are running the business and their metrics are well does this make me money is it generating value for me is it saving me money and if you aren't ans if you can't answer those questions well good luck kind of hard there's lots of plans made at the beginning of a software project saying these are the goals this is the justification and well as we learn from history plans don't always match reality the french built a nice range of fortifications or what 
I feel in modern day America they would call a wall. Germans just went around it. Reality does the same thing. It will suddenly change and users will have different opinions. Back 10 years ago it was a standard that everybody would be using IE6. Today, who's using IE anyway? Maybe the people who need to don't have a proper browser yet. Testing, guaranteed stable environment because then otherwise you can't test. Reality, messy, unstable, things change. One request will get answered in one millisecond, the next one will take two seconds. It happens. Testing doesn't have humans involved. A test environment in DTAP doesn't really have humans. You have machines talking to machines, talking to machines. So you have got a very consistent environment because that's how you run scientific experiments, right? Well, in reality, you have actual users and they don't do what you want. But you bet you should click this. Nope, not gonna. Okay. Latency. How many people actually run tests where your every request is delayed by a random time between one and five seconds? That's often enough a real-time user experience. You don't have the same millisecond latency. Software failures no, aren't always in terms of this system failed to respond. It responded, but very slowly. In any distributed system, that's the most common mode of failure. And you're dealing with the distributed systems all the time. So potentially high latency, I mean going from here to the, the US is high latency if your development environment is sitting in the next room. And of course you have not always the same size, you have a sample data set and depending on how good your sampling is, well good luck, sometimes things work and sometimes you just go like, why does this Unicode character not fit in? Why is this person not able to put their name in? Why is there a question mark? Well because we forgot about Unicode. Or we are using MySQL and we are using their UTF-8 standard and actual UTF-8 needs UTF-8 MB4. You don't discover this in testing because your data set is still all 7-bit ASCII. Yeah, giant pain. And of course, humans do strange things. We all know how users behave, especially if you have worked help desk. Why are you trying to do something is an interesting question that uh, most people are like, well, I thought it was a good idea. When people make mistakes, or they actually have goals that your software is not supposed to help achieve, but hey, it's their business goal, that's what users want. And you should be like, well, what, why are you doing this anyway? Software will grow until it sends email. Then wh wh wait, why are we sending email from this software? Oh, because people can't cut, copy, paste, or that's the only way way in which I can send a report to my partners because it's a large file and we can't upload, we don't have SFTP, we can't rsync it to them. So your opt alternative is somebody puts data on a USB stick and takes it or you send them my email. Okay. Users come up with different requirements and sometimes people just change the world their software is running on. Used to be that everybody had a desktop PC, then it became laptops which was still smaller PCs and then suddenly you got phones. You had lots of compute and almost no storage and for a lot of things you could had to have an app. And now you're getting everybody has their own app, well, and now the web doesn't really work. So, solutions to this, traditional approach. Risk management, well, you scope your problems well, you have a very well-defined scope. This is the scope, this is what we are going to do, this is what we are going to deliver and it's going to be exactly like this all the way including the color of every pixel on the screen. We are going to have a 15 page form here which will collect all this information, it will be in this color, all that, you know, and then you test a lot and lots and lots, then you release code and people go through the pain of a code release and everybody is bitching about it and uh, at the end of it, well, works, it does what it wants to do, let's not make any more changes. Well, because it works. And then you are like, well, but our, why are our competitors doing something different? And can you do something different? If you're a small company, this works. If you're writing desktop software or intranet software, this approach will even work. But if you're doing something that's on the scale of a slightly bigger company, then you know you're, you have to keep changing systems because sometimes you have different laws, different regulations, currency rates change, whatever. 
you want to find out more if you're doing B2C commerce, even more so because then you don't know why people buy and when people buy. In Europe, July and August is peak uh, holiday season. You go to India and it's May and October. And then you're suddenly, but why are we not getting traffic from India in May, June and July, which is peak August, which is peak holiday season? Nope, because that's monsoons and school, that's the beginning of the school year. You're not, people aren't going to go on vacation then. October is festival time, of course they're going to go on vacations. May it's too hot to go anywhere except for the hills, so you can literally be like, okay, this is where people will go. This is what people will do. Risk management, your other option of course is that you have, don't know what problem you're trying to solve. Software as market research, you accept that you don't know the, that problem and then you say, well, it's, or it's an ill-defined problem why people are buying. So you're going to just run a bunch of tests, lots and lots and lots of tests. How many tests could you run? There are maybe a few thousand concurrently. As long as you have built your tooling for it, a few thousand isn't very big. You iterate rapidly, you make a number of small changes rather than making one big deployment. Instead of having a release every sprint, you have a release every time somebody finishes working on a ticket or even faster than that because you can just put out a th code without actually exposing it to users, especially with a web service. High speed iteration also means that you get faster feedback and faster feedback gives you, well, you learn what is a bad thing sometimes. Some ideas are really good and they're like, well, this is good if you've got three users, but when you have 200,000 users, it's not going to work because, well, this thing that you just built needs a terabit of bandwidth. Hmm, we don't have that. You optimize your deployments and rollbacks rather than saying, I will be very careful with rollbacks and uh, take uh, or rollouts and take downtime during that. So you, the, if this process is fast, then you can take more risks. So you take a much larger amount of smaller risk with lower impact, and then the cost of a, an outage is much lower. Human experience says that people will accept, you know, that you have two minutes of downtime is 10 times a year is better than one 20 minute outage. 20 minute outage, people notice. Two minutes, oh, I'll just come back in a couple of minutes and retry and it works. So, must have been my internet connection. People will blame anything except the actual problem. Then you build software to isolate changes. There is this concept called feature flags. They existed for a long time. It was popularized by Etsy for quite some time when they did their whole uh, ten, uh, 10 rollouts a day uh, flicker paper, you know, John Allspaw. Feature, uh, feature flags help you in multiple ways. You can roll out code. You can actually run code without ever exposing it to users because you just send traffic down that path. Uh, you just su suppress the response coming from that feature. You can do things like, oh, what is the cost of this SQL query going to be in production? Sometimes you're just running a large query, you don't know, maybe you need a new index or maybe it's just something else is broken. You can do a lot of testing in the real world, A-B testing all the time, what prices work, what colors work, maybe you get a color thing that maybe in Europe it's not important but in China in the new year they might buy more because, because red and red is a lucky color, so you want a red font. Or maybe that doesn't work, you don't know until you test. And there's also this whole thing called multi-arm bandit testing for when you can't do AB. And then you can keep only what works. You can monitor down to the lowest level, which is also fantastic for debugging. It's fantastic for business intelligence. So if you're talking to your managers and you're like, well, I can give you even more uh, data that you can use for analytics, they'll go like, ooh, more data, I like. So, and how much can you trace down into? Well, nowadays you can just say, oh, I know that this particular set of hard disks is having problems. This machine is slow because my data distribution is wrong. Or this, this particular function call is taking too long. You instrument it down to that level and then you can hunt it down. You can also save a lot of money and time by not writing code. Code has fairly short lifetimes if you're doing a lot of rollouts, bad experiments, hours, maybe sometimes days. 
Some libraries go on for months without a release. And unless you've got core libraries, those will stay. So libc will stay around for a long, long time, but maybe some features facts will come up, not be there. Lots of rapid iteration even in libraries. And if you're using version control, you can delete code. Some, I know some people who still, in this day and age, will just comment out code and then co push that commented out code into production, or at least for review. Well, I mean, it's in version control. We can always revert things. But it's going to be painful. No, it's not. You can just delete code. You can keep your operational code small and easy to read, which is, if you talk to a developer, it's a big win. Monitoring, structured events, uh, sorry, so structured events are anything that could be like a key value pair or any well defined structure which you can uh, analyze programmatically. So, not freeform logs. Freeform logs are traditionally nice for debugging, but you can also put that, you can put in all your latency metrics with names and values or even more complex nested structures. So, you can track a whole event as in a request came in, it was processed here, it went to this other thing, it went to this other microservice, it went to this other system, and with a constant re consistent request ID, you can track them all and say, oh, this is what the user did. This is what happened in the system. This is what we can see. Uh, Riemann.io uh, uh, is a very excellent tool for generating ev alerts from event streams. So you don't even have to care about saying, oh, this minor thing or is a problem. Server load is a problem. Software is a pro or this uh, system is not behaving correctly. You don't have to ask a load balancer about are nine boxes being up out of ten a good thing or a bad thing? In at non-peak season, that may be in peak season nine boxes may not be enough. When you want fifteen up, but you can look at their results from Riemann and say, oh, this system is being slow. Your alerts are all actionable. They are all business metrics, and your manager can go. Why is this thing, why are 10 servers being down a problem? Well, the system is up, it's running, it's responding fast enough, why would we keep them up? And you can go, or you can go up, boss, we are losing money because we need more hardware. We are running out of hardware here. Look at the pager alert, it's telling us we are losing money. That kind of thing gets your manager to be this very, very responsive to problems. You generate graphs as close to real time as possible. Well, if you aren't doing graphs from your software, you aren't going to get a lot of useful output. Time series data is one set of useful output. But take your time series database, they all suck. They all suck differently though. And uh, But you can, autom you can pretty much quickly see, oh, this thing went wrong, that thing went wrong. Friday evening deploys should not be a problem. Friday at 6, maybe not. But 5 p.m. Friday, meh, who cares, just roll it out anyway. As long as the person doing the rollout watches their uh, output, what, they can see the graphs and be like, oh, this works, this doesn't, or this system isn't in use yet, we don't care, or this is, we understand this is production and best time to do or to get feedback is right now, works for us. And if you isolate your changes, you can track the longer term effects of each change going, oh, this, we put, we made this change last week and this week it is now causing problems. Maybe we should restart this service or maybe we should rethink this because sometimes your problems accumulate. A query isn't necessarily slow. It doesn't mean that it's going to back up your database, but it adds a query thing and then everything keeps backing up and suddenly six hours later or a week later, you now have such a giant queue that the whole application is now failing over and timing out. Don't ask me how I know this, or oh, you could. We were missing an index on a query, and that went from, so we made the change at like 10 in the morning, the system went down at 4, in 4 a.m. the next day. Not the best wake up call I've received. All right, so, bunch of references and questions. This is a fairly controversial topic, well, or used to be. So questions about mechanics, stuff I haven't covered. No questions? Okay.
uh, something that started off as a disaster. Ooh. Don't think I've had that yet, but uh, there have been a bunch of times when uh, we have decided that we should make, so I used to work back in India at a company that wasn't very fast at doing rollouts. They would have this one giant rollout a year for their main uh, money revenue earning product. And then the two months after that were basically people trying to catch up, fix bugs, and the help desk getting lots of calls about what changed, what didn't, and nobody had a clue of what was, why things were going wrong. And then uh, they improved their process, they introduced a bunch of agile processes and stuff, and got uh, metrics to see what was wrong. And uh, they improved uh, quite a bit of their life. People went were from working uh, 80, 90 hours a week to going home at 5 p.m. five days a week. So that kind of worked out. Booking is a classic example of uh, you how you do testing in production. So is Amazon, so is Facebook. So, I mean, this, this sort of infrastructure helps prevent disasters. It's a real-time feedback system. It's like how you walk. Walking is you're continuously falling, and then the last minute you reach out your leg and stop yourself from falling. So, it's exactly like that. Nobody else? Um, sorry. Yeah, uh, sorry, I didn't get it either. Oh, uh, so okay. So how do you? Uh, the question is, how do we match our observations and metrics with user experiences? Uh, so essentially, I would say you define your metrics for your user experience, for or start off with a set of metrics. So you say, software must respond this fast. This users will perceive so much latency, which is a thing we know if it's so many milliseconds. If it's faster than that, it's fast enough. 60 hertz refresh rate is fast enough for us. So we know a bunch of stuff based on human mechanics generally. And then you can say, okay, how many users actually find that comfortable to use? How many people stay around for long enough? How many people leave quickly? How do you find your funnel? How do you, which is basically how do many people get to the end? How many people can achieve their goal? And you go, oh, this is a problem. This is not good. You add a bunch of more metrics. You remove the metrics that doesn't matter. You keep changing. You can keep changing things on the fly, especially with web services. So you can say, oh, this font doesn't look good, or people are responding badly to this font. People are creating more tickets here, which is yet another feedback loop. We have got more customer service calls. There are two more people having problems for getting passwords. Or people are being able to break into systems easily because we have we don't have two-factor authentication. Introducing two-factor authentication is not something you can just do one shot. So user experience, all that counts into user experience, I would say. So how does this work? Maybe people have need to be able to explain in more detail. Maybe our metrics are too granular, and business metrics could be just way too granular for anything. Or not to or they are too fine grained and we can't make out we can't make any sense of this so you have metrics that you can build in and you say oh you be, you define an end goal for the for your software which could be people need to buy this people buy more of this buy less of this we want less customer service calls and then you say how can we get less customer service calls uh, so classic example for booking was when they put in a checkbox that said for a hotel booking that the users could freely cancel, they just put in a checkbox that said, I can manage my booking online and cancel it anytime. Turns out 50% of their calls dropped 
because they had a bunch of people calling to cancel bookings that they could have canceled themselves online for free. They just thought they had to call for a cancellation. So simple user interface metric, one change, and called massive call drop. So big, big wins. You can get big wins from small things like that. But if you don't do that, then well, you don't know. Anybody else? Nope. Okay, then thank you. Thanks.